So hello everybody. Hopefully you can all see that. Please wave your hands up, put something in the chat if you can't. Good stuff. Um, and good afternoon. It's lovely to be here doing this uh, again, what's become a, an annual event, uh, talking about Jersey amphibians, which I'm always happy to do. Just to say I can't be there and do it in person. Um, let's hope for better next year. So obviously this is a talk about uh, Pond Watch Jersey, the scheme for surveying, surveying Jersey's pond life. And Denise is going to be talking more at the end of when I've finished about how you can get involved. Let's see if I can now change slides. Hmm, okay. Apparently not. If there's a little arrow sometimes down at the bottom left-hand corner. No, there isn't. Oh. Hang on, I'll just have to uh, stop sharing for a second, I'm afraid. I feel like when these things happen, I always feel like I should play hold music to people. Hi, this is Stephanie Addison. Um, if you press return. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Or just click on the slider. Sometimes that works. It depends if you're using using PowerPoint. No, it's because of it's because I'm in full screen whilst I'm sharing. If it's easier, John, do you want to not be in full screen? Yeah, yeah no, it's all right. I'm, I'm, I'm sorting it. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> it's not really a Zoom call unless we have some sort of uh, technical issues or, um, or if we have to say something like, you're on mute. <laughs> it's definitely, we're all used to this now. Right, now hopefully you can see that. Yes, we can. Good. Right, now it, this should work. There you go. Ah, oh, fantastic. So um, as I was saying, uh, Denise will be talking more about how to get involved when I've done my bit. So what we're going to look at um, in particular today are some of the priority things that we'd like you to record in Jersey's ponds, uh, particularly amphibians. I'm going to talk a little bit about grass snakes as well go through a few things to do with dragonfly and damselfly identification, one or two other invertebrates, just as a, a sort of um, dip into, pardon the pun, dip into what you help all the things you might find. And then we'll look at one or two non-native plants, which have, have important conservation implications for the island and we want them recorded. So without further ado and further mistakes, we will start with the good old palmate newt. This is the only uh, newt found in Jersey and indeed the native newt of the Channel Islands. It particularly likes um, heathland habitats but can be found just about anywhere. That's basically what they look like. They can grow up to nine centimeters in size but they're often a lot smaller than this and you can find little males breeding in ponds at about three centimetres. You can find them in your pond um, pretty much all year round, although they don't all stay in the ponds all year round. But the peak period is something like February to May. Now, this used to be ubiquitous in Jersey. They used to breed in the ibis enclosure at the zoo, uh, and you could find them in anything that would range from a puddle to a large lake. Um, nowadays, you don't see them quite so often, and we're very keen to get records of palmate newts um, to try and have a look at what might be going on with them and whether there's any problems with them. Hopefully not. It might just be a case of us needing more records for them. Being the only newt in the island, you hopefully won't mistake it for anything else, but you can be certain of what you're looking at as a palmate newt because of certain features. So this is a feature of the hind foot of male palmate newts, and it's where they get their name from. They have a dark, heavily webbed rear feet, which looks a bit like a sycamore leaf. And if you're looking at one of those, if you catch a newt, you're looking at a male palmate. 
They also have, and this is mainly the males, you can sometimes see a tiny, tiny filament on the tip of a tail of a female, but basically it's the males have this extended uh, filament on the end of their tail. And this is what they wave at females during the breeding season to get them interested in laying eggs. Just to say though, um, at various times of the year, especially late summer, uh, autumn and winter, palmate newts tend to be terrestrial. And this is the only time where they might get mistaken for another species really. Um, you know, potentially they do get mistaken for baby lizards. Although I always say, if you can walk over to it and pick it up, it's a newt. And if it runs off, it's gonna be a lizard. But just to give you an idea of uh, how they vary when they're on land, the one on the right, if I can get my cursor going, is an adult palmate newt, which was under a rock I found somewhere, definitely a Jersey one though. And the one on the left is a young animal. So these might only be um, two centimeters or even smaller if they've only just left the pond. And younger palmate newts very often have this distinctive orange stripe running down their center of their backs, as well as this sort of attractive scalloped pattern either side of it. Here's some more palmate newt pictures. So the top one is a very, very um, colorful male in, in breeding condition. They don't always get this color. Uh, you can see there, they've also got orange flanks on the side of the tail. And that one particular has got a very large filament on the end. The females, on the, in, in contrast, lack these features, uh, even in the breeding season. They're more plain in colour. You'll often find them lurking in aquatic vegetation where they're looking for places to lay eggs. Uh, and in many cases, you won't need to do this, but just out of interest, oh, sorry, I've done that. Uh, just out of interest, if you flip them over and have a quick look at their back feet, the females have got these two pale nodules on their hind feet. And that can sometimes help you tell the difference between a male and a female if it's not fully in the breeding season and the males won't have developed their black boxing gloves and their filaments on the end of the tail. So it's just something to look for. And actually it's quite good fun uh, trying to find that feature anyway. So just to go back where I said before, there's our terrestrial palmate newts again. And clearly, you won't be mistaking them for wall lizards, I hope. Wall lizards, of course, do have scales, but the most important thing is that you won't be able to walk over to them and pick them up. So there's our newt. Um, the only other place in the Channel Islands where you get native palmate newts is probably Alderney, so they are quite special. Jersey's probably the only, well, the Channel Islands, including Alderney, are probably the only place in the world where you only get palmate newts as a newt. So, you know, it's a very interesting thing. Let's go on to agile frogs. Again, the only true frog uh, in Jersey. You get common frogs in Guernsey and on some of the other islands. Um, and again, they are the Channel Island native frog. They are also found in uh, nearby France, but uh, within the British Isles, this is the only place they occur. And as you can imagine, they're basically frog shaped, but especially with smaller individuals, it can be possible to mistake them for a crapo. So we just look at certain features to make sure uh, that you're absolutely certain what you're looking at is an agile frog. Most importantly, agile, long muscular back legs. The eye color is fairly nondescript, sometimes verging on gold. But the other thing we tell you to look for as well is this wonderful uh, eye mask and they are bandits. So that's something very much to look out for. The amount of variation in pattern and the color of the pattern does vary. So go more on the body shape and whether they've got an eye mask than anything else. In, compared to, in contrast to the crapo, of course, they've also got a relatively more pointy nose. And you can see on that slightly grainy picture there, the agile frog's pointy nose and its eye mask. But of course, you won't find them everywhere. They are the rarest amphibian in Jersey and probably the rarest amphibian in the Channel Islands, actually. 
Um, they are their stronghold these days is Wayne, although they are found now in a couple of other sites uh, on the west coast or on the west of the island, I should say. And if you want to get involved with agile frogs, contact the environment department. Uh, but you won't find them everywhere. So that's something to help you with identification should you need it. On to my favourite one now, the toad or crapo. Um, males and females tend to be different sizes or at least fully grown females can be extremely large. Uh, I found one once at Gorsons that were with 123 millimetres in size, uh, it was more like a baby hippo than anything else. Um, but they're lovely to see when they're that big and they can be very big and spiny. Uh, that reflects the species' new scientific name, which is Bufo spinosus. Yet again, the only place in the British Isles where this species is found. It looks very like a toad you might find in England, but actually they evolved in probably what the equivalent of uh, central Spain uh, before the last ice age. And after that have spread further north. So they're only found from Jersey through Western France, the Iberian Peninsula, and also in North Africa, but not England. So again, another unique species, and of course, one which Islanders are duly quite rightly proud of. Now, um, hopefully I've chosen pictures here that get used quite a lot, but they do show the differences between frogs and crapos. Obviously you've got a warty skin but also the legs are nowhere near as muscular and long. They will hop away if they're threatened by a predator, but what they normally rely on is basically tasting nasty uh, and they exude uh, secretions through their glands either side of the head. In contrast to the black eye mask of uh, an agile frog, the crapo's darker markings are always behind the eye rather than running through it. And then the eye itself, is uh, this rather deep shade of orange or even a reddish bronzy colour, as you can see in the picture on the right. There you go. So there's a close-up of a toad eye. There are other beautiful things. I always think I should produce a calendar of uh, toad eyes because it would probably sell very well. If anybody wants to fund that, give me a shout after the meeting. Uh, and again, you've got difference in the nose shape. You've got a much more truncated, blunt, shape of the nose than you're doing an agile frog. So hopefully there won't ever be any confusion there. And that's just an emphasis there on the warty skin, which is a way more obvious than it would be in any kind of frog. Just a note about uh, sexing toes, which also applies to, the, to frogs if you're lucky enough to be able to get close enough to see this. This is a bufospinosis, although it happens to be a French one. Uh, it's a very masculine old beast, this one. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us, but he was rescued by some people who'd been camping and um, ended up living with me. They have what we call nuptial pads on their front feet, and they use this for gripping onto the females uh, when they're trying to persuade them to mate and lay eggs. And in toads, uh, they're very obviously swollen, uh, rough, warty, blackened pads on the inner fingers and the thumb. You get a similar effect in male agile frogs, but they don't tend to be uh, dark in color in the same way that they are in toads. So that's just a, uh, a way of telling males from females other than the size differences, of course. Now, uh, just in case you've had any problems with frogs and toads, don't forget eye mask, eye color, difference in the nose shape, and even when they're just very, very new babies, just emerging from the ponds, you can still tell them apart. So the agile frog baby on the left, when they leave the ponds, you can still see they've got these big muscular back legs, even at a tiny size. They very often have uh, the remains of their tail when they're leaving the water. With a crapo on the other hand, and this is a proper Jersey crapo from Grone, and that's my thumb it's sitting on. It's only about 10 millimeters long. You can really see it's already got a tiny little blunt nose uh, and they normally have lost their tail completely when they leave the water. They're very, very vulnerable at that size and at that period in their lives, as you might imagine. So toes in particular, when they leave the water, don't have fully developed lungs and they need to be uh, damp but not wet and certainly not dry. They're absorbing oxygen through their skin and you'll find them congregated in damp places by 
enough oxygen without either desiccating or drowning and it's a big problem for them a lot of them probably get killed at that time of life so something else to look out for and that's going to be happening variably in jersey between sort of may and uh, or possibly earlier and possibly later depending on the weather the other thing to note about uh, toads and crapos is unlike in the uk where uh, we've just started to get the first records of our common frogs breeding you will get toads breeding before the agile frogs in jersey so toads and the breeding about this time of year just as the weather starts to warm up and frogs don't start breeding till normally i always think about valentine's day in jersey that's a very good indicator of when they like to start breeding just a quick note on some other things that might turn up because they do. People are well-meaning and they know that amphibians need conservation. So happily, they bring back tadpoles from England and France and wherever else they've been. This, of course, is a terrible idea. Uh, so things to look out for, although it's very, can be difficult to tell a common frog from an agile frog, they do turn up and the same way water frogs also do. However, they're much easier to identify. They're very loud for a start. The males call loudly and they have these um, double vocal sacs, one either side of the head. Um, several of these have been collected from the wild in Jersey, but also just bear in mind that people do keep amphibians as pets and other species might turn up as well. So obviously if you find any of or these things or you think you have, uh, try and take a photograph and do let the environment department know so that somebody can go and have a look and try and track them down and get rid of them. Just a quick note about eggs, because obviously uh, one of the things Pondbot wants to do is to work out where species are. And if you turn up on the wrong day or in the wrong weather, uh, and you think you've wasted a trip to, to whatever pond you're looking at, you've actually got a chance to detect the presence of species without necessarily seeing any actual adults or juveniles. You can look for their eggs. Happily, this is also uh, fairly straightforward, although you can get confused sometimes. So let's start actually with the top right, which is a clump of frog spawn. They're always in clumps sometimes not as big as this, there's probably three clumps of spawn there. Agile frog spawn is laid amongst aquatic vegetation or reeds or twigs sticking out of the water um, and can, can be difficult to spot, but if it's in a clump, you know it's frog spawn rather than uh, toad spawn. Bottom left is a typical view of what we might see of toad spawn. So two strings of eggs, this is fairly fresh toad spawn, as it swells with water, it gets um, sort of um, pulled apart, if you like, and the eggs aren't as gently packed as this, but it never looks like it's in clumps, except, of course, when it's been sat in a pond for weeks and weeks at a time. Now, normally, amphibian eggs hatch in about two weeks, depending on how warm it is. What happens in Jersey when the toads breed early and then there's a frost later on is it basically stops development of the eggs and you get strings of very swollen toad spawn that starts to sort of die at the surface where it's very, very cold and it looks quite different than it does when it's fresh. So if you see something like on the bottom right of this slide, you can be sure that that's toad spawn. Happily, uh, you can see in this picture some of the embryos are still developing and also underneath the dead and dying spawn you've got there, you'll find there's plenty of eggs still alive, which will develop. And newts are even easier, although it does take practice to find newt eggs. In the UK, we tend to say, have a quick look inside a fold folded leaf to see what species of newt egg you've got. There's no need to do that in Jersey. What you're looking for is, um, a folded leaf that looks like it's got a little pin cushion trapped in it. And this will only be about three to four millimeters in size. Um, with practice, it's easy to spot the folded leaves. Uh, as I say, you don't need to unwrap them, but if you can um, find those, you, you can say that there's likely to be newts in that pond 
and that's always useful to know. And it's also a great thing to do with the family or the kids, uh, get them out there and, you know, see if you can spot the most new takes, making sure that they don't actually take them out of the pond and leave them where they are. So three species of amphibian, uh, and you can tell them all apart by their eggs, which is happy. Similarly, tadpoles, they're all different looking. Um, when they're tiny, tadpoles can be difficult to identify. But as they grow, frog and toad tadpoles look very different. So these two tadpoles in the top left are at just about the same stage of development. And the frog on the left is brown or grayish and speckled. The toad on the right remains black. You can see they're just about both getting their back legs there. The other difference between them when they're bigger and more active is that frog tadpoles will hide in the mud and the leaf litter at the bottom of the pond. Toad tadpoles are much braver, more brazen if you like, swim around in groups on the side of the pond. And this is because even as tadpoles, they are distasteful to predators. So it's safer for them basically to be out in the open and being obvious. Some predators will eat them. For example, blackbirds seem to be able to learn to how to eat toad tadpoles. I'm not sure what they taste like, but it's not something I'm likely to go and try, to be perfectly honest. And then if you're doing pond dipping as part of your pond watch surveys, you might find tadpoles. The one on the right at the top is a very, very freshly emerged new tadpole. It's probably only three or four millimeters in size. They mostly get mistaken for fish fry because there's very little to tell you that that's going to turn into a newt. Again, as they grow, they're more obvious uh, as a tadpole. The difference between newt tadpoles and frog tadpoles and toad tadpoles as well is that frogs and toads get their back legs first. Newt tadpoles get their front legs first. People ask me why this is. And I say, I haven't got the faintest idea, regrettably. There must be a reason for it, something to do with the evolution, I expect, but I really couldn't tell you. The other thing they do have that frog and tadpoles don't, or at least you can't see, are these, where's my cursor gone, are these feathery gills, which remain until they leave the water. And in older frog and toad tadpoles, you won't ever see that. So they do look very different. They've also got a more obvious spotty tail fin. So again, another way of uh, determining the presence of species in a pond without seeing any adults. Moving quickly on to grass snakes. Well, why are grass snakes in pond watch, you might ask? Well, it's because, I'll just whiz forward to that, it's because they are semi-aquatic. And they are, of course, Jersey's rarest reptile. We're very interested in knowing where anybody sees grass snakes. One of the reasons they're aquatic is they like to eat amphibians. So in order to protect Jersey's rarest reptile, we've got to protect the amphibians, otherwise they won't have as much to eat. Just to go back to that slide, that's a very typical shot of a young grass snake. Um, they will grow up to a metre long, so you can't really mistake them for anything else. And they very often have this McDonald's sponsorship thing going on with the golden M on the back of their neck. Just to note that in Jersey, um, the species quite often loses its golden M. So if you see a large snake, it's probably still a grass snake and uh, try to get a photograph of it so that we can confirm that record. Also very inter interested, just by the way, in knowing if anybody sees um, sites where grass snakes are egg laying. So that could be a compost heap or a horse manure pile or a pile of rotting vegetation. Those are, and they won't necessarily be near a pond if you find one. Okay, so uh, just one final point on amphibians and reptiles, which is that very, very occasionally you get the odd daft slow worm that wants to sit in a pond and swim around. This isn't normal, um, but you can see it. So just don't mistake a slow worm for a grass snake. They are much smaller. They're of course a lizard, not a snake, and they don't have any of the kind, same kinds of uh, markings that grass snakes do. Okay, on to non-amphibian and reptile things now. Uh, one of the uh, elements of pond watch involves dragonflies. It's more complicated, of course, to identify dragonflies and damselflies than it is to do amphibians. 
but with a little bit of practice, you get better at it. I can't say I'm, I'm any kind of uh, super expert at dragonfly and damselfly identification, but our friends at the British Dragonfly Society give you a lot of hints as to what things to look at to determine what the species are. So one of the easiest things, uh, ways to do, especially while the weather isn't as good as it might be, is to have a little practice on their website before you go out and try and do your surveys. And what they recommend is looking at various um, features on the uh, dragonflies and damselflies as they're flying past you or sitting down and letting you look at them with any luck. And I would say the most important ones are probably side markings on the thorax, the thorax being the central part of the body there, side markings on the abdomen and the characteristics of the appendages on the end of their tail. You can't always so easily see the markings on the face unless you happen to be looking directly at the dragonfly and you can't always so easily see coloration on the legs. They also want you to look at the top of the animals. So the markings on the thorax, the same with the abdomen, the appendages again, and also whether or not they've got any coloration on the wings, uh, especially blobs like you can see on the outside of the wings of this dragonfly. The other thing to look at or to know is whether you're looking at a dragonfly or a damselfly. And um, they give you a table, which I don't expect anyone to remember uh, whilst we go through this talk, although you can, of course, review it afterwards. And I think, again, here, there are some more important things um, than others. So dragonflies are usually larger and certainly more robust in the body than a damselfly, whereas damselflies are always fairly delicate looking. And that's reflected by the way that they fly. If something whizzes past you at great high speed and uh, catches a fly out of midair, it's probably going to be a dragonfly. If something flutters past you quite prettily uh, and it looks a bit dragonfly-like, it's probably going to be a damselfly and you have to try and track them down and see where they land to see what species it is. Um, something that's reflected in the larvae or the nymphs of both species is uh, also the body shape, stout, quite um, chunky for a dragonfly nymph. Uh, with spiky appendages on the back end, whereas damselflies are thin, slender, and have a more sort of feathery appendages on their rear end. And I do have a slide of that, which might even be coming up next. Oh no, there's, there's just a dragonfly and a damselfly to show you the difference. And this is um, another hint as to what you're looking at, really. Um, dragonflies tend to be very uh, proud when they sit, they stick their wings out at right angles to the body and show off to anybody passing by. Damselflies, again, are a little bit more demure, which is probably where they got their name from, and they tend to rest with the, with the wings close to the body rather than stuck out. And you can also see in this slide the difference in the thickness of the abdomens and the difference in size which is a, a good indicator of what you're looking at. So uh, just to say uh, something about the various groups of dragonflies that you can find. Um, broadly speaking, hawkers uh, are dark in color and can have brightly colored spots. We won't go into identifying individual species. Darters and chasers tend to be bright in the body, blue, red or yellow. Uh, sometimes a mixture uh, and with darker markings. And then there's the emeralds, which are uh, dark green in color, quite often metallic and sometimes very, very bright uh, with bronzy tints. So again, this is something that you, we can all practice doing by the time uh, the surveys come round. Um, I've been asked to highlight a couple of species we're particularly interested in looking at. So let's start with the one on the right for no readily apparent reason. Uh, this is a southern emerald damselfly, uh, rather like emerald dragonflies, it's green with bronzy tints. But if you look at the way that that is sitting, it's not quite the same as a normal damselfly. And I think that's quite distinctive of that species. They tend to sit with their wings sort of looking a little bit droopy. 
The one on the left is a beautiful demoiselle, and they are um, not difficult to identify, I would say. These are key species that we're looking for records of. They have these very dark, shiny, translucent wings, very, very fluttery flight, uh, quite obvious if you see them fluttering around. And the only thing you can make mistake them for really would be a banded demoiselle, which also has a dark marking on its wing, but its wings are otherwise um, clear with just a dark marking in the central bit there. So look out for those and we'd be very happy to get any records of those in. I knew there was a nymph picture somewhere. So this is just contrasting the differences between nymphs of dragonflies and damselflies. They are commonly uh, caught in pond nets when you're looking for amphibians and amphibian larvae. And as I said before, the dragonfly has got a very thick, stout body with these short appendages on the end and they're short and stiff. The damselfly nymph is much more um, skinny, nowhere near as robust. And as you can see, its appendages are actually gills, um, but they're much more um, flexible in nature. And if they're swimming around in a tray that you've got perhaps to look at things, you'll see them, they're much more moving about than the ones on a dragonfly will do. And I would recommend if you are doing pond watch surveys to have something like a white plastic tray that you can look at whatever you catch in because it's much easier to see their features. So again, the um, range of pond life that you can possibly find is uh, quite wide just to note some of the other things that you might see. Uh, and it's difficult for me to, to ask people to shout out what they might think this is, but hopefully you recognize it. This is a back swimmer or water boatman, depending on where you're from. And this is a photograph taken from above. So hence the name back swimmer. They'll be swimming around on the surface of a pond, waving their legs around and they swim around quite fast. They can also fly, so they will turn up in quite new ponds sometimes. Um, that's one of the kinds of things. There are different species, but it's difficult to tell them apart. This following slide, which is fairly terrible, is, is zoomed in quite a lot. If you can imagine these things whizzing around manically on the surface of a pond, we've got whirly beetles. And of course, there are a range of other beetle style animals that you will find, um, not all of which are easy to separate out. Photographs are always good and sometimes you can see identification features that will enable other people to identify them to species. So really that's a good um, piece of advice for whatever you find if you're not sure what it is, try to get a photograph. Then something that can get mistaken for other things quite a lot. These are stone flies on the top. We've got a nymph they do a very good job of pretending to be dragonfly larvae sometimes, although if you look closely, they're, they're not that similar. Uh, they've got two rear appendages, uh, which stick out at angles like you can see. And eventually when they stop being larvae and start being adults and flying around, they look uh, rather like the animal at the bottom. Again, there's quite a few different species which are hard to separate. Um, stoneflies mostly get mistaken for moths when they're adults and will come to light traps if you're if you're into that as well so but it's good to record those and the other thing that uh, tends to go around pretending to be a dragonfly larva is this which is the larva of a water beetle and uh, we were fortunate enough to find quite a big one of these when I came over last year uh, which was nice uh, again almost impossible to tell what species at this stage but do record any that you find. And finally, um, non-native plants. As I said before, they are potentially a very serious conservation problem, not only because they shade out all the species, but actually they can result in the complete loss of some ponds, especially natural ponds, uh, just by filling them up, because basically nothing native will eat them. Uh, and there's nothing to stop them going mad. So again, our friends at the Non-Native Species Secretariat uh, are providing a lot of information on this. What I'm just going to go through today is the main non-natives that 
are the most worrying and uh, the best to look out for. Starting with uh, the water fern, otherwise known as Azolla. They are uh, fern-like, but as you can see from the box there, they are quite tiny leaves and you will just see basically the surface of the pond being covered with uh, a green or reddish uh, leafy mess. If you find these in a pond, I have found these in many places in Jersey. You can sometimes see that they've got uh, little aquatic roots that stick out. You don't want to get these on your pond nets or on your pond equipment. Um, so just be aware of that because it spreads very easily much more information on this on the uh, non-native species website. This could be the worst one. Um, it's a problem everywhere. I spoke to a chap from Old New Wildlife Trust a few years ago and he said um, we've got a big pond in the middle of Old New. Um, it's got so much pygmy weed in it that the rabbits can walk from side, one side to the other without getting their feet wet and I thought oh dear uh, this has turned up in the wild in Jersey but it's not it's not that easy to be sure that you're looking at a New Zealand pygmy weed. It's also known as crassula. What you might see more than anything is again, um, a sort of mess of mossy, like slightly succulent stems forming dense mats in the water. At some times in the year, they get these tiny little uh, white pinkish flowers, which aren't always easy to see. However, to, just to help you, just in case you, do spot this species is uh, it comes in different forms um, and that makes identification even more difficult so underwater they grow sort of long and leggy like the ones on the right hand side uh, they will also grow up onto the banks of ponds and again look more like moths than anything else and then sort of there's an intermediate form that lives on the edge um, you get to know these things with practice, to be perfectly honest. Again, try and take a photograph if you can, if you need identification confirming. Just to note that uh, in many Jersey ponds, I mean, most obvious place I can think of, to be honest, is Grone Pond, but they are found elsewhere. You get a similar species, which is very much native and um, not at all uh, undesirable, a rather nice thing, which also has rather nice little white flowers, uh, which is starwort. And there's a few species of that too. To be sure, you want to be looking for, and if you need, I mean, I know I'm wearing my glasses now and I need a hand lens to see this, I can assure you. you, you uh, you're looking for the little notches in the end of the leaves and that tells you you're looking at starwort rather than um, pygmy weed. So something to look out for, not to mistake that for. There's also various kinds of non-native waterweed, which is typified by Canadian pondweed or waterweed. Many people have had this in their ponds or in their aquariums, and it's gone a bit mad. And they used to think it was fine to dump them into the wild, but of course they are not native and they will affect uh, native plants and animals. So something else to look out for. Probably most people kind of recognize that. Um, Different species have various degrees of curliness to their leaves. And again, a photograph is going to help us try and identify those. So something else to look out for. Lastly, you'll be pleased to know is parrot's feather. This is an emergent, uh, which, which will grow underwater, but like in the photograph of the, on the bottom left, um, grows above the surface of the pond. So it's not easy to mistake for anything else. And funnily enough, the leaves look rather like feathers. As you can see from the um, picture on the right hand side, um, they are made up of filaments rather than being a solid leaf. Um, some native animals will use this, but it's still not a good thing to have in the pond because eventually the pond will just be filled full of it and, and dry up. So again, do let us know if you find it. And I think that might be the end of that talk. So hopefully I haven't gone over too much time. Uh, I just want to thank you for listening. We'll hear now from Denise and then open ourselves to questions, I think.
Thanks, John. That was great. I'm sure lots of people got lots of great information from that. I'm going to try to share my screen. I'm wondering if I might have the same issue, but I only have four slides where I can come in and out as needs be. Let's just see if it's going to go forward. No. So I'll stop share. I'll change slides. I'm not sure how you did it, John. You seem to... to I had to stop sharing uh, and make sure I wasn't in full screen in PowerPoint and then share again and then open and then select PowerPoint and then it worked. That oh. makes sense. Right. Okay, I'll give it a quick go. But if not, I can just hop in and out each time. So I'm not as familiar with this one. I'm going to stop sharing again. Sorry, guys. But yeah, I'm just basically going to quickly go over um, how to get involved. Um, obviously, we can't do a big thing about how to survey ponds um, at the moment because of COVID, our lovely, bizarre time. Oh, okay. Danny, if you go back, um, I think it's it I'm I'm happy with it like that and you can just go between screens if um making it full screen isn't um isn't working. Um so can everyone see like can can people see the majority of the text on the screen there? I can. I don't know if if, if you can hold your thumbs up if you yeah, a few people Yeah, it looks okay, Danny. Okay, thanks, Liz. Just keep it like that. Okay, we'll go for that. <laughs> yeah, um, so, yes, as we can see there, um, Sarah is from the Jersey Biodiversity Centre, and this is this little screenshot there at the top of their website. And as you can see, you can go to enter data, you can add a casual record. So if you're out and about and you happen near a pond, you see something, you can record it there. Again, it's always great to take a photograph, and most of us have access to be able to do that now. Um, and you can upload that so you don't have to log in. However, you can also log in. There's the, the login or register for an account over there on the right, across on the black there. And the benefit of doing that is that then you can keep all your wildlife records there. So, you know, you can, it's a great way to kind of keep a record of everything that you've seen in one place. And um, so that's the bonus of having an account over just a casual record. Uh, so that's what you can do if you're keen to, to do that much, and that's fine. But if you want to do a little bit more, then go to pondwatch.je, and that brings you automatically to a page, a dedicated page on the Jersey Biodiversity Centre website that uh, discusses the mainly level one and level two, and that's kind of what we're talking about here um, of Pondwatch. So you can sign up to do surveys. So um, it depends then on the amount of time. So if I go on to the so you can see there, I've laid it out, well, somebody else did that, <laughs> laid it out levels one, two, and three. Um, so you don't need any experience or training to do level one. Now, obviously, you probably want to chat to us, and that's what we can do. So obviously, with COVID, we would normally have our day together, and uh, we would go through then what to do. But we can still do that over Zoom. We can still do that. I mean, depending on restrictions as well, we may be able to get a small group together. We'll just kind of have to wait and see. That's, that's the, the world we're living in at the moment. But we can definitely do things. And we can get, uh, so John mentioned there, the, um, the white tray if you're going out. We can also lend out that those, and we can lend out thermometers and nets. So again, we can do a safe, compliant way of getting those to you um, and so that you can go out and do your 30-minute survey. And that's just between January and May. You just have to do one. If you wanted to sign up to do level two, it's a bit more, you're doing five surveys and then the last in between 30 and 60 minutes. Um, again, no experience, but we will go through some training in more depth. Because we talk about things like um, biosecurity as well, like if you're going from pond to pond and cleaning your equipment and things like that. Uh, we're talking about the methods that you use if you are pond dipping and a safe way to do it for everybody. Uh, so we go through all of that as well. And then level three is more so 
that's where you, you know if you've been doing this maybe some some people out there who are listening have um, done some before and they want to maybe step it up and it's more so to do with agile fogs as well but again we talk about that uh, in time so people probably will have questions about this but what else i'll go on to my next last one but what i say for this session and um, because of time that i saw there was a few questions in it and um, that would direct our questions to john because we have john here as our expert on all of this but if you've got any questions about how to survey, they can be directed. So here it is there. It's the wildebeest jersey at gov.je. That's the email that will come through to us. Um, and then there's the our web page there. Or you can get in touch with Sarah and she'll direct you to us as well. And then that's where we go through about, um, oh, we go through the survey form, of course, as well. Uh, level one, level two, slight differences between them as well. And then... Um, it's always good when you see a survey form, as I think there is on the um, the links that Sarah put on the Eventbrite page, um, that sometimes, I know with butterflies as well, people see the survey form and they go, ah, but it's never that bad. So it's grand and we go through things with you and explain how it's all done. Um, and again, we go through how to do it, when and where. And uh, um, no, I didn't say it in this. So if, if you don't have access to a pond, but you're really keen, we can assign a pond to you that we either monitor before or we want monitored again. Um, so it doesn't mean that you can't get involved if you if you or your neighbor or you know a relative doesn't have a pond. Um, you know, we're not all that fortunate. Um, so you know there is there are ways to get involved and, and we'll um, and we'll do the land ownership permission as well. We'll obviously have to get in touch and make sure everything's all set up for you. So that's how to get in contact with you. So um, I'll probably best now to, with the time, to open up to questions. Um, and as I say, while John is here, I think there's a few there, Sarah, um, that might be good. And I'll, I'll uh, go back to that. Thanks for listening, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Danny. Um, yeah, so we do have a few questions in, in the chat. So I'm just gonna pull those up now. Um, We've got one about um, a, asking for a photo of the newt eggs. So I'm assuming, so instead of having just the leaf, what do the newt eggs actually look like on the inside of that leaf? So and if you don't have a photo now, um, I'm sure we can always post one. Oh, wow, you have, fantastic. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I read the question. So yeah, there's a question about uh, whether there's only one egg in each leaf and what the egg inside looks like. Well, obviously, this what we don't want people to do is go around unwrapping them. But for purposes of training, we've um, we've made this slide previously. Uh, and as to the first part of the question, there's normally only one new egg in each leaf. Female newts only lay one egg at a time. But in ponds where there's not very much aquatic vegetation, you'll get um, a female newt, say, laying an egg and then moving on to another leaf. And then another female newt might come along and try and lay an egg on the same leaf. And that's especially true if you've got uh, long uh, grass blades uh, going into the water. And what you can get if there's really not much vegetation at all is something that looks rather like a concertina. Um, where, where four or five female newts have laid the eggs on the same leaf. Clearly in the slide, we've got uh, two types of egg. Uh, hopefully you won't be finding great crested new eggs in Jersey, even though they're an interesting thing because they don't belong there. But a palmate or smooth newt egg, which look very similar, are this uh, sort of muddy gray color and generally slightly smaller than a, a, palm, a great crested newt egg. So three or four millimeters, a close up of a newt egg uh, looks rather like that and that's actually a great crested newt egg but just to give you a, a real close-up the reason I got that picture actually is somebody had fished it out and looked at it and not put it back in the pond which is really really naughty and I thought well I'll just take a quick photograph of it but um, so there you go that's what newt eggs look like. Ah, thank you and um, we also had a um, question earlier on um, that was about um, dragonfly nymphs. So um, can they be a vivid green colour? I'm going to say yes. I think there is 
uh, a group of dragonfly nymphs that, that can be green. But I can't, off the top of me, and I'm ever so sorry, I can't actually remember what kind they are, but uh, mate, that can be your homework. You can go and look that up on the internet and find out what species those are. Um, got a question from Anna about the crappos, so the Jersey toads. Are they safe to pick up? They are safe. Um, we would recommend anybody handling any amphibian or pond animal would wash their hands afterwards before eating, etc., just to be on the safe side. Um, the uh, nasty tasting skin secretions in a toad won't do you any harm. Not that you want to get let your dog going around eating them because they will be uh, violently ill, but they can't hurt you uh, unless you uh, do very stupid things like trying to collect the venom and smoke in it, which is never recommended. Any other questions? Um, you can either unmute your chat. Sarah, so I suppose we should point out that all the animals are protected under the wildlife law. So really, um, perhaps we, we shouldn't be handling them unless we've, unless we've got a license to do so. Sorry, that's a good point, Chris. Right. Sorry? Yeah. yeah, that's a great point. Thank yeah. you. And obviously, it's that time of year you know, where you can come across them on a the road. And so in those sort of instances, it is fine to pick up to move them out of the way because you're you're disturbing them, you're picking them up to save life. So that's fine. Yeah. But um, yeah, we wouldn't just recommend people um, picking up or collecting tadpoles or things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And we do, don't we? Up at the... John, I've got a question about the newt eggs. Um, those photos um where the the leaf was um pick i'm assuming was was picked off the of the off the plant mm -hmm. it, um would you advise us that we don't do that and we just leave the egg um attached to to the plant absolutely yeah um it's it's fine to if you can hoik a little bit of the plant out out of the pond without breaking the leaf off just to more closely examine uh, examine the leaf uh, with the egg in it, uh, and without unwrapping the egg, uh, just to make sure it's a new egg and not something else, and that's kind of fine. And we recommend that this then put back in the pond. So those photographs were explicitly for the use of training. Um, I'm wondering if I've got a photograph of some new eggs that are uh, been. I can't find that one, sorry, but um, yeah, um, you will risk killing a new tag if you unwrap it and take take the leaf off the plant. So yeah, we don't recommend that. I would, uh, the best, by far the most fun thing to do, to be honest, is to learn how to spot them when they're in the pond and be, be confident. And you can do it, I promise you. I'm still waiting for the day that I find one, um, but um, maybe this will be the year. We've got um, a question about when do newts lay their eggs? So what time of, of the year? That's a very good question, actually. They're not like frogs and toads. So a, a male frog and a toad, with, uh, which are in the mating embrace and plexus, where the male hangs on to the female to make sure he's the daddy. Um, their spawning is over um, with a frog quite quickly and with a toad probably over a, sometimes a day or two. Female newts lay maybe 200 or even more eggs over a period of several weeks and every one is individually placed within a leaf or elsewhere in the pond hidden. Um, so they take a great deal longer, which is why really you find newts in ponds for a lot longer than you do find frogs and toads. Um, I've got a question about um, goldfish. So when is the best time to remove goldfish from ponds? Um, so Anna has inherited six goldfish, um, but wants to revert that um, pond to a wildlife pond. So can she just get rid of those goldfish at any time? 
Uh, well, the sooner the better, really. Because, <laughs> uh, of course, goldfish, although lovely, are a non-native species, and um, they will go around. Um, they will eat frog spawn. They'll eat. They'll pick new eggs out of leaves, uh, and they'll chew on toad spawn as well. And although they may not eat the embryos, they might kill the spawn just by chewing on it as well. Uh, I think the biggest problem with removing goldfish is knowing what to then do with the goldfish. Uh, so if you've got a home for the goldfish, hook them out any time. Um, I've got a question about what to do um, if you find invasive plants in your pond. The uh, question about crash, I'm not sure what I should do with it. Full of tad, tad, new tadpoles and tadpoles some of the year. Yeah, um, as I said, newts will use crashula to lay their eggs on. Um, if you've got a small garden pond, as many people do, the biggest problem is making sure that it doesn't take over. Um, so what you can be fairly certain about is that you won't be getting new eggs towards the end of the year. And we recommend that any work maintenance or clearing out of ponds is done late September, early October time, and you'll get fewer pond animals generally in the ponds at that time. The way to deal with the possibility of a few leftover new tadpoles or other tadpoles uh, in the pond is to put something like a bin liner next to the pond, uh, which maybe hangs into the water and any weed that you clear out can be left on the on the side of the pond for a few days so that tadpoles, etc., can wriggle their way back in. Um, and that's fairly standard of advice for pond maintenance. Um, and yeah, you'll you'll you should be all right doing that. Okay, so a question about leaves in ponds. So um, in autumn I have a problem with leaves turning my pond copper colour. Will this cause the water to become toxic? And what can I do from Julie? Well, again, the short answer is eventually, because um, the pond can cope with, like a natural pond, any pond can cope with some leaves falling into it. But over time, uh, too many leaves create an, uh, 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 an environment in the pond that lacks oxygen. So it will start to affect the pond if they build up. And the advice is the same, really. Um, clean out the bottom of the pond if you can get to it in uh, September, October time and leave the leaves on the side uh, so that anything that's hiding there can crawl out. Um, we had a question earlier about whether you can do um, pond watch with children. Absolutely. Um, I would recommend the level one for primary school ages and then the level two for probably year six into secondary schools. Um, if there's any teachers here um, on the call, today and um, please get in touch with me because I um, I run these um, pond watch sessions with with schools so if you've got a class of you know 20 um, to 30 children um, we can run the pond watch level one with your class and um, I know with the COVID regulations that might not be possible for me to actually do with your your students this year but if you want some advice on how to run them with your school group please get in touch um, it is a really fun session to do and um, we'll collect lots of data which will be used um, for the pond watch um, survey so we're doing a bit of conservation work as well so we've got i'm going to do one last question because we have run over um, and it's how do you get rid of bull rushes from caroline with great difficulty <laughs> lots of cutting lots of th there's no substitute with bulrushes for removing them every year until they're gone and ideally you need to get yourself or someone else in the pond and get the roots out otherwise they'll just grow back again I'm afraid and, and although they are native and very often welcome used by dragonflies when the nymphs climb out of the water of course and shed their skin to become adults um, they are a useful species to have, but many ponds these days are much smaller than a natural pond would be, um, and bulrushes can take over. So I'm afraid there's no substitute for just keeping on top of them and getting them out. 
Uh, and but, if you're worried about disturbing wildlife, again, do it in the autumn. Yeah, I was about to say, any kind of removal of plants or any pond work, um, we recommend, yeah, you do that in the autumn, um, kind of September, October time. Um, Fab, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, all the information that um, we've used today, so including John and Denise's talks um, and links are on the Eventbrite page. I'll also be posting lots in the next week on the Jersey Biodiversity's Facebook and Instagram page. So if you've not liked those already, please like those. Um, we're gonna be posting all about um, Pond Watch um, in the coming weeks, getting ready for your surveys. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, John and Denise. Thanks, so, everybody. Thanks, yeah, everybody, for joining. You can unmute yourselves now and say thank you. Take care. Great to see everybody. Thanks, William. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.